Welcome back, boils and ghouls, to another episode of Off the Beaten Rack. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please like, comment, and Hulk smash that subscribe button. I know it's been a little while since I put out a video. I've been dealing with some personal health issues, and it is just really difficult to work on longer scripts. And unfortunately, a couple other channels have released videos that overlapped with stuff that I've been working on for a few months, and I want to give that some space, so I've basically had to go back to square one. I'm working on an interesting Darwin Cook episode right now, and I came across a wonderful interview. Now, essentially all I do in my free time is watch random interviews with comic book artists and creators and historians and historical retrospectives about comics. I know it's really sad, but it's how you guys get this content. In this 2015 WonderCon panel, Darwin Cook really opens up. It's only about 13 months before he passed away from cancer, and from his comments, you can tell he obviously knew he was sick. Team this with the fact that it was held by a couple of guys that he really had a history with, and it just seemed like some amazing information poured out of Darwin Cook. He was getting some stuff off of his chest. One of the coolest things that I found out about was about his first ever published work. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Darwin Cook's first ever published work was a five-page silent noir story that was published in DC's New Talent Showcase number 19 in October of 1985. It would be 13 years before Darwin Cook would release another comic. Why is this? According to an older comics journal interview, I had always believed that it was because he couldn't monetarily make it work. He got paid about 35 bucks a page and he could only do about a page a week. That's just not going to work. But in this interview at the WonderCon panel, he actually revealed that he could not get work after this story. So I wanted to dig this story back out. I wanted to share it with you guys. I know that a lot of collectors are completely unaware of its existence, considering it is 13 years before any of his other stuff. It's not superhero stuff. It's a five page noir silent story. However, it is amazing in my opinion, and I thought it was crazy that he could not get work after this. So let's hop on over to the table and check out the first ever published Darwin Cook piece. So this is the cover we're looking at for Talent Showcase number 19 from October of 1985. And this is Darwin Cook's first published work, 10,000 Small Bills or Girl Dies. I don't know if Private Eye is supposed to be the name of the character or a proposed series or what, but the Private Eye title is also prominently featured at the bottom of the page, and I've always supposed it was likely a combination title and would read like 10,000 in Small Bills or Girl Dies, semicolon, the Private Eye, but I don't know. It's only five pages long, so I thought we would flip through it really quick and check it out, and then we can go back and do just a little bit of analyzation and I'll talk about the history of 10,000 and small bills. The opening title page is really well done, but one thing to note here is that Darwin Cook's signature animation-like style is nowhere to be seen. There's a lot of stuff I feel like I see going on in Cook's work at this period, but he definitely had not developed his own unique style, which is understandable considering this is his first professional work ever. Another thing I would point out about this title page is how evocative it is of an actual noir story from the old pulps or even evoking the feeling of an old EC title with the car hurtling directly at us from the bottom of the panel, even though an EC story would never have devoted this much space without at least a great deal of text to the opening of a story. As I said, Cook's distinctive style isn't quite yet formed or on display here, but his flair for design and layout certainly is. Even looking at this title page, it's hard to believe that this is Cook's first professional foray into a short narrative story. 
The story itself seems simple enough. We have the titular private eye arriving in his car. He grabs out a suitcase, presumably filled with $10,000 in small bills, and heads into what appears to be an abandoned warehouse. Lurking behind the door is whoever is responsible for kidnapping the woman we see in the other panels, who is tied up, gagged, and lying on the floor. The private eye comes in, sees the woman, and appears surprised as we see a gloved hand reaching for a light switch. Looking at this first page, I'm still amazed at how well it works. The panel layout is obviously going to be a bit conservative and the figures look like Cook is doing his absolute best Neil Adams or Bernie Wrightson impression. Just because it's Darwin Cook, I'm guessing that it was definitely more of a Neil Adams thing, but the woman in this looks like she fell off of the covers to one of Wrightson's DC horror titles to me and he would have been super popular at this point, so you know, who knows. Despite not being the most inventive, every panel here is absolutely essential. They also do an immaculate job of conveying the passing of time and the consecutive playing out of the actions from panel to panel. There's an almost cinematic appearance to many of the panels, and many of them have the appearance of a great director or cinematographer who's still perfecting and refining their craft. The gunman gives the private eye a good pistol whip and we think he's out for the count. He goes down as the kidnapper starts spreading gasoline all around the room to burn up the evidence, which is the girl and the private eye. There's some great panels here. The close-up of the kidnapper's hooded face in the eye of the woman is just gorgeous. And it's something I don't remember seeing all the time in comics when I was growing up. That kind of thing was more like the covers from the studio guys and other independent stuff at that point, and I think it's really cool. The shot of the private eye hitting the ground is really well done to me as well. I don't know why it grabs my eyes so much, but it really just feels masterfully done to me, and again, the layout of the page provides you with an incredibly readable sequence of action from beginning to end. There's no confusing, weird weird panels where stuff is spilling out everywhere, and each panel has a palpable beat. It represents a single moment passing in time captured in a still frame. If you've ever seen Le Jeti, the story has always reminded me of the pacing and layout of that film in a lot of ways. Obviously not actually down for the count, the private eye gets to his feet while the gunman is distracted, dumping gasoline all around the poor girl he has tied up on the ground. The private eye literally yanks the rug out from underneath of him. A moment of some brevity here, I think, by Cook, who then proceeds to have the private eye light the gunman on fire with his own gas and matches while he's still alive and conscious. The beat of, hey, he just yanked the rug out from underneath of him, not only of evokes a more light-hearted sense of fighting and that they don't punch each other around for the entirety of the page, but also a more realistic one. Cook was never a guy for huge needless slugfests eating up valuable real estate in his books, and when you've only got five pages to tell a story, you've got even less space for dalliance. So the private eye snatches up the woman, carries her to a window, and then crashes through it with her, saving them both from the warehouse, now completely engulfed in flames. Names. This last page is wonderfully executed. If you think about the amount of story that's been conveyed in the last four pages with zero dialogue, it's pretty impressive. And as I said, the panel layouts are extraordinarily well paced, if a little bit conservative. This is for good reason though, as Cook always seemed to have a wonderful grasp on not only visual art, but the art of visual storytelling as well. This last page shows the private eye untying the woman he's rescued as they watch the warehouse burn, and we realize that he chose to save the girl and not the money which is burning inside the building in the final panel. As the preceding four pages are a kind of whirlwind of concurrent action, this final page feels calm and relaxed. More spaced out and contemplative, perfectly conveying the mood that the private eye's face seems to be conveying as well as he looks back on the burning warehouse full of cash holding the woman tightly next to him. This tells us also that he's a good guy in the sense that he would rather the money than the woman burn and that he's likely somehow involved with the woman in one sense or another. It's tight, concise, and it looks awesome if a little bit unrefined. That being said, it's better than at least 
90% of the crap that Marvel and DC were putting out on a monthly basis at this point. I definitely would have bought something like this as a full-sized magazine or a book or a title or a collection of stories, whatever, if they had put it out and I had known about it. It is a real shame that Cook couldn't get work in the comic industry to the extent he left for 13 years before coming back with a vengeance. Or maybe I should say a revengeance. So let's get up from the table and I'll share some interesting tidbits that I've learned about Darwin Cook. Cook has said in interviews that he became a comic book artist and a storyteller for a number of reasons, but that one or should I say two of the main reasons were his father and grandfather who he thought were superb storytellers. He said that he could just listen to them tell stories forever and it wasn't because of the stuff that they were talking about, it was how they told the stories. 10,000 and Small Bills is a perfect example of this obsession Cook carried with him for his clear, concise storytelling. 10,000 in Small Bills is a simple story, but its execution, the way it's told visually, is what makes it super interesting. Cook, from the very beginning here, despite not even having refined his own art style, is already working to master the art of visual storytelling. There were also two comics which were instrumental in Cook's decision to go into the field. He picked up a magazine-sized reprint of an early John Romita Stanley Spider-Man story and said he instantly fell in love with comics. It was a Batman comic that he got right around this time that would really seal the deal and galvanize his need to tell stories in the comics medium though. There was a Batman story called Night of the Stalker and it was plotted by Steve Englehart and penciled by the husband and wife duo of Vin and Sal Almendola with inks from the immortal Dick Giordano which happened to be edited by the equally legendary Archie Goodwin. I also want to mention there's an extremely bizarre edition of the credits of Night of the Stalker that I have never come across in comics before or since that I recall. At the bottom of the credits there's a small addendum noting quote, from an incident as described by Neil Adams, end quote. Obviously, Night of the Stalker was published during the Neil Adams era, where Adams was basically redefining the fundamental aspects of the Dark Knight that most of us recognize in him today. It might have simply been a way to include his name in the credits where they otherwise couldn't be used to sell the comic, or Neil Adams might have actually suggested the idea for this story, in which case it's just another example of the almost innumerable contributions, many of which go completely unnoted that Neil Adams made during this era to Batman. Either way, Night of the Stalker originally appeared as part of Batman number 439, which was one of the 100 page super spectaculars from February of 1974. And while a lot of his diehard Batman fans know it and love it, it's definitely not one of those super talked about stories you hear people go on and on about all the time. When Cook bought Night of the Stalker though, he said that it was the moment he knew he had to become a comic book artist. It had that profound of an effect on young Darwin Cook. If you've never read Night of the Stalker, obviously you should, but I'm going to drop a small spoiler here for a 40 year old story. It doesn't ruin anything, but it does reveal a kind of cool twist. If you've never read the story before I go any further, be warned. In Night of the Stalker, Batman watches a couple of goons kill a kid's parents and it essentially turns him into an orphan as well. Batman flips out in a very Batman way. He doesn't kill anyone or anything, but he proceeds to disassemble the gang responsible one by one for the rest of the story, which has a very somber tone. It's dark, it's gritty, it's gorgeous to look at, and it does not read like the typical mainstream Batman story from 1970 or even 10 years later for that matter. The really interesting thing about Night of the Stalker is that you get to the end and you realize that while there are narration captions and we do hear characters speak, Batman himself hasn't uttered a single word throughout the story. Night of the Stalker stands as a testament to the power of the visual storytelling aspects that are achievable in the comics medium and it is this story, almost above all else, that seems to have driven Cook's burning desire to tell comic book stories in a 
bunch of different ways. Not only would Darwin Cook continue to draw on the powers of the visual storytelling aspects afforded to you in the comics medium found essentially nowhere else, he would also continue to harbor a deep and abiding love of noir comics and stories, another theme which would never be far from sight during Cook's all too brief stint in the industry. The crazy thing about all this is that 11 years later and completely by happenstance, when Cook arrived at DC Comics in hopes of selling 10,000 in small bills to them, Sal Almendola, the man who penciled Night of the Stalker, was the man making that call. The man responsible for his wanting to be a comic book artist in the first place was actually the guy in charge of making the call whether or not he would ultimately achieve that goal. And Cook sat across from him at the table during the entire meeting and never even mentioned Night of the Stalker or Almendola's impact on his life. Cook constantly spoke about how he felt he was an industry outsider and was treated as such for the entirety of his career by publishers and editors, especially at the big two, Marvel and DC, who didn't know what to do with him. He might have become an outsider, but in 1985, Sal Alamandola, one of the main men responsible for fostering his love of comics, was sat looking at Cook's stuff and had no idea what to do with him even then. Cook tells a great story about how he could tell that Sal liked the story but had no idea what to do with it. He didn't even know if he should really buy the story from Darwin Cook. Who was going to read a silent five-page noir? Just then, Julie Schwartz walked into the room to talk to Sal about some random thing, and Sal was like, hey, I need your help. I like this guy's stuff, but I don't know what to do with him. What do you think? And Julie Schwartz just glanced over the pages really quickly and was like, buy it. And that's how Darwin Cook sold the story to DC. I can't imagine that there was an extremely large readership for Talent Showcase to begin with, but unfortunately for Cook, 10,000 in Small Bills was published in the final issue of Talent Showcase, and I can only guess that there really weren't many people reading it at that point at all. Whatever the case, 10,000 in Small Bills seems to have basically been published with zero attention and interest. No one stood up and recognized this new talent. No one saw the courage in doing a silent noir story. I've never heard people talk about this story when discussing Darwin Cook or his history, really, and I'm always perplexed as to why. When you read or you see interviews with Darwin Cook, it isn't really brought up either. The old quote that I used to hear as to why Darwin Cook originally left the industry was that he was only capable of producing about one page a week and was earning around $35 a page, as I mentioned. Obviously, that's not economically feasible, so when he got the chance, he went to work as the art director for a rock magazine, honing his graphic design and illustration skills before then moving on to other illustration jobs and then beginning his long partnership with Bruce Tim on on Batman the Animated Series years later, which itself would then lead to his eventual triumph and highly lauded, if almost inadvertent, return to the comic books field. However, Darwin Cook explained himself bringing up the subject at the WonderCon panel, where he seemed to be just letting it all hang out, that he literally couldn't get work after this story was published. It wasn't that he wasn't just making enough money off of his work, he wasn't getting any work at all. Cook brought this up while talking about his feelings on being an industry outsider from day one. Somehow people just didn't know what to make of him or how to take Darwin Cook. He explained that the only reason that DC ever really called him was to tell a certain type of story that he was no longer interested in telling and something that they were rarely interested in talking about and approached him about even less anyways. While the stories he did create will likely go down as some of the greatest comics ever created, this story begs the question of what we missed in the 13 years between this and the discovery of Darwin Cook's proposal for the Batman story that would eventually go on to become Batman Ego. How many amazing stories he could have told during these years he spent in the advertising field. Looking at the body of his work, the timelessness and the strikingly original work that he left us with, it seems like more than enough, and maybe I wouldn't change anything. But if I had the chance, I'd definitely shake Darwin Cook's hand and I'd tell him how impressed I was with this story.
Thanks so much for sticking with me. I really hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did, keep an eye out for another Darwin Cook episode coming soon concerning exactly why he didn't do much work with Marvel and any after a certain period. In the meantime, links to my digitally available sources as well as a list of further reading can be found in the description below as always. If you did enjoy what you saw, do me a favor and hit that like button. It really helps out the channel. And if you really enjoyed what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell to keep up with all these videos that I'm dropping all the time at this point. If you like this video, if you have any questions about this video, or you'd like to suggest a topic for something, please think about getting in the comments section below. Not only does it really help out the channel when you all leave comments, but I've done a few and am working on several amazing videos from suggestions from boils and ghouls just like you. So thanks again for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.